I am Jeff Foxworthy and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. So look, let's get started. Here we are in Nashville at the NWTF. There's everybody walking around talking about turkeys, and we've been wanting to have Dr. Brett Collier from LSU. We've been wanting to have him on our podcast for a while. Yeah, been hearing and, great things. Just hadn't made it happen yet, but here we are. Found out he was going to be up here, so we we drug the little board, and Dudley has learned how to plug everything in, thanks to Rob. Oh, and, yeah. Let's and, not touch any buttons Yeah, here. making me sound great so far. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, so looking across the table, we're looking at uh, Dr. Brett Collier. And I have to say, I'm, uh, and I didn't know what to expect, but there, there you are. Uh, you know, I hope you didn't expect more attractive because you're not going to get it out of <laughs> me today. You know, the daughter was giving me a hard time this morning. She's like, you don't got a forehead, you got an eight head because you're going bald, Dad. And I'm well, like, yeah, you know, that is what it is. I, I mean, got the same if one. You, if you get hungry uh, during the intermission, we've got some corn dogs headed your way. Excellent. I, I know you LSU people <laughs> love eating corn dogs. Oh, yeah, so. that's, that's what they tell us. So I'll, sti- <laughs> I'll stick with boudin and, you know, a good gumbo. Oh, man. Love, so. me, love me some boudin. So I'm a little confused. You, okay. You're, you're an LSU professor. Yep. At, but you live in Michigan? Yeah, so uh, that's a great story. So um, I, I was, uh, I'm down at LSU, and um, my wife, uh, Reagan, is a federal scientist. And uh, she had been a federal scientist kind of before we had moved to LSU, and then she was teaching at the university. She's a PhD as well. And then the federal government kind of called her back home. Uh, with a job up in Michigan. So, so I split my time now when I'm teaching and, and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm down in, in LSU in Louisiana. And then whenever things are kind of slow, um, like all of my grad students are in the field, you know, tracking turkeys and that kind of stuff, I make spur, more sporadic trips. And then we've got places in both states. So uh, I hope IRS isn't listening because, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, we got places in both states. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's the it's a two-body problem of, of you know, two professional like academicians and scientists, you mm-hmm. know, in that mm, the federal government is, doesn't do a real good job of accommodating partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and universities often don't accommodate partners at the level that they should be accommodated at. So they don't create say tenure track scientist positions like the one that I'm in for, you know, partner type of thing very often. Yeah. Um, at least some universities. So, you know, and we make it work. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a uh, the commute sucks. <laughs> I bet. It's, yeah, it's uh, it's you know like eighteen hundred miles door to door, so it's a uh, it's pretty rough. But there's a there's a two thousand eight Dodge Ram that has seen every single mile of I fifty seven and fifty five back and forth. Wow. So yeah. So How it's a. Uh, so yeah, we've been doing that. I guess uh, it's been about six years now. I reckon since since we had bought the house up in Michigan, and then I got my place down in Baton Rouge, and it just kind of works. No, it's not perfect, but it's okay. That's cool. <laughs> I, I live in a college town, and I've got professor buddies, and and that's not uncommon at all. Yeah, it it, it the the two body problem is difficult, you know, and right. it's it's worse with kids because you know Kennedy, the daughter's twelve, so we're we're getting into that you know middle school tween, you know being a kid but you also have all the other activities that go along with that right you know so everything from swim team to acting you know the the little local you know acting group that she acts with mm-hmm. to you know whatever else have rock climbing club that she's on and so it's a balancing act you yeah know? we got some good friends and you know they help us out whenever we need it and you know we live in a pretty small town so that makes it pretty easy too that's so. cool and the the cool thing about it is you you like being outside, obviously. Yep. So now you have two different venues. Yes. You know, Louisiana and Michigan are vastly different. Yes, so. they are. You know, we got uh, – it, it's a – you know, Michigan's a great place, and, and uh, we enjoy having the house up there. Um, there's, there's a turkey up there that uh, thought I had his name last year, and uh, he beat me uh, about 12 straight days. Um, there you go. So maybe he'll be around this year. We'll see. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, I'd go left and he'd go right. I, he had my number for sure. So, but uh, you know, it's it's a fortunate thing that the university has been really supportive um, in in supporting you know Reagan and I with this kind of weird arrangement. So I do a lot of teaching in the fall. Okay. Um, whenever I'm down there, because most of my classes have historically been pretty fall oriented. 
Okay. Um, yeah, things like wildlife management techniques and pop dye and teaching kids how to catch stuff and set fires and that kind of jazz. And, uh, you know, then in the spring, like right now, I mean, I was telling you guys before we got started, you know, we're catching turkeys this morning. You know, so all my grad students are all out in the field right now. So nobody's on campus right now. So, so they're out there catching turkeys and you're here. They are. Uh, they are not only are they out there trying to catch turkeys, they caught turkeys this morning. They got uh, eight the first thing this morning. Uh, it'd be about 745, I think they shot, okay. or 720 this morning. They shot a net over uh, seven females and one male. So about that. Yeah. So. And uh, we were talking about this when we were walking up to mm -hmm. the podcast room. Uh, you caught an interesting gobbler? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, so Patrick and Rachel are the, the two graduate students out there, and they sent me a message, and they're like, hey, we got this bird that doesn't have any spurs, and it's got an 80-inch beard, and it's an, it's an adult male, um, and we don't know what to make of it. And I was like, well, are you sure it's not a bearded hen? Because, you know, the, the first thing you want to do is be, all right, are you, did you sure you sex it correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, mistakes can be made. And they're like, oh, no, it's a male. And they sent me a picture, and it's definitely a male. It's got a nice eight-inch beard, and it's just no spurs, just straight-legged. This is the day as long. I've only seen – I think we were talking, you'd shot maybe one or a yeah. couple of them. But, yeah. you know, they get shot pretty regularly across the United States. We see evidence of it happening. But there's a lot of birds shot in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of birds get shot every year in the United States and in, in individual states. You know, we're, we're catching – few hundred maybe mm -hmm. in Louisiana on any given year on a good year to catch one's pretty rare. I've only seen two in my career in the last 20 some odd years of catching turkeys. One, one this Eastern and then one Rio. Well, that'll that be interesting it. to learn more about his personality. Yes, it will. You know, maybe he acts a little bit differently because he doesn't have those two weapons on the back of his legs. Perhaps, you know, I've, uh, Spurs are really interesting to me because we've always historically assumed as turkey biologists that, and people that watch turkeys, that they're weapons, as you just said. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dive off on the side here, but um, I'm not entirely sure that's 100% true. Um, if you think about the the reproductive strategy of, of a, a male and a female turkey and how they have to angle their bodies to do the cloacal kiss to, mm -hmm. to you know copulate – um, spurs actually, I think also provide the leverage points so the males can anchor and not, not fall off. Cause if you think about when they set and people can't see my hands, but when they set on their back, mm -hmm. they've got to turn their cloaca almost down and under to reach the females and they have to lean way back. And I think they provide a little bit of a leverage point okay. as well on the, on the back of the female. And I can't prove it. It's just a theory that I have that they're not just about fighting that you know they're they're also about reproduction. So so you could know. you look at a at a female <clears throat> after they had done the, the this and maybe she might have some scarring it's, or something. It's the where I think it catches actually is I think it catches in the feathers. I think it catches in the retrix feathers on the back. So they they when they anchor in and everything they're right at that point where um, the uh, tail feathers start to transition from the uh, the back. Mm. Right. And I think what you're going to see is you'll see that because those feathers are real thick. If you think about, you know, you see people with the, the mounts of the, excuse me, the mounts of the skins and everything. Mm -hmm. Those feathers are, they're real thick. There's a big stack of them right there. And I think they, what they do is they just kind of leverage in right there, almost like kind of on the back of their hips sort of mm -hmm. thing. So um, I don't know that they dig in and would like scratch or something, but, you know, I've seen an awful lot of birds, you know, reproduce. And it's always just struck me as weird that, males would have something for fighting that faces away from what they're fighting. Right. You know, that they got to flip themselves up into a, you know, non-safe position to, you know, that's a good point. Kick back. Yeah. Right. That, that, so they're that, really just kicking with their feet and they just happen to have spurs. Right. You know, and that, maybe they provide, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm, hundred percent certain that spurs provide some sort of a defensive mechanism. Sure. Uh, absolutely. But they could also have dual function. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, which is a weird thing to think about, right? Right. You know, so, um, so yeah, they're probably weapons, but I've always thought that they probably play a, a little role. So I wonder about this guy, which is what's cool because this guy's got a GPS unit on him now. Mm -hmm. And um, we caught him with a flock of females and he's the only, only male we had on camera with him. We've got genetic data on him because we took blood samples. We got genetic data on all those females. So maybe we'll see if he's able to make offspring with them. You exactly. Know, whenever we're catching flocks next year, so it'll be it'll be interesting. You know, turkey right. science takes time. See where he ends up on the pecking order. Yep. And right now he seems to be at the top, but we'll see what it is in a couple of months. Interesting so. stuff. So, how did your career take a uh, the direction of turkeys? Oh man, 
Uh, that's a good story. Um, it involves alcohol. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was at a bar. Actually, that's part of the story. Um, so uh, I actually did my dissertation work at the University of Arkansas. I was with the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit there. And uh, my PhD advisor was a guy named David Kremitz. He's retired now. And um, uh, I, had, I had a weird background. Um, I was, uh, I'm really into math. So math and statistics was kind of my background. That's, that's what I really like to do. And um, I started working in natural resource economics for a master's degree at Oklahoma State. And I did some not overly fancy math, but some pretty neat math that was applicable to human dimensions work, like studying hunters, right? Because that's what I did my thesis on at Oklahoma State. And David saw it and, and had a position open studying deer. So I studied uh, the antler restriction for white-tailed deer for my PhD in Arkansas whenever the whole QDMA three-point rule thing was a big and sexy kicking, deal. Yeah. yeah, like just starting up. I mean, this was, long, this was 99, I guess, when I started. Or Yeah. Um, and then as I was getting ready to get done, um, I had a friend that I'd met, uh, a guy named Nova Silvi, who was at Texas A&M University. Um, he's retired now, living the best life down the Florida Keys. And I told him I wanted to work on upland game birds. Because they're, you know, I didn't see a real future in deer because everybody wants to study deer and they're just big brown land rats, right? You know, and, and they're awesome. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big deer hunter. But Pine you know, goats. Yeah, it's just like whatever. They're deer and everything. <laughs> awesome. Um, and and you know, I don't really care that much about bone on their head. So you can't, I've, I've tried every recipe in the book. As my buddy Luke says, I still can't make antlers palatable. <laughs> I just can't do it. So I don't waste a lot of time there. But Nova and them had uh, been doing some turkey research uh, there in Texas. And um, they uh, funded a postdoc position for me, um, which is like a like an intermediate scientist, like after your PhD and before you become a faculty member, you you kind of go into this transitional zone that's called a, a postdoctoral research associate, and and you kind of learn um, uh, more intimately with faculty about how to do science, right? And not everybody does one. Some people go right to faculty positions. It's not a, a better or worse thing. Um, and I started running a, a Rio Grande project in the hill country of uh, Texas. Um, and I was out in uh, like a Kerr and Bandera and Real uh, counties, Medina County, and um, had had that project. And I ran the last three years of it and worked with a few graduate students um, that are doing great, by the way. I mean, we've had, we've had a, such a successful set of graduate students in my career. It's amazing. They're, they're a testament to just how good they really were. Um, and then... Um, just one thing led to another, and I kept getting these small projects, you know, working with Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, and uh, it was Steve DeMasso before that, and then it was Jason Harden, who's a current turkey biologist in Texas. Um, and I kept just get another project, you know, just, all right, we're going to do another real project, and we want to do something in South Texas. We want to do something in the Hill Country. We want to do something here. And, and pretty soon I was working on turkeys kind of full-time, you know. And then in 08, um, I was at, here's the, the drunk in a bar story. And in 2008 is really when the transition occurred for me. And, and I became kind of a, this is what I'm going to be doing full time. I'm, I was at the wildlife society meeting in Monterey, California, and I had a really good friend, um, Chris Kahani, who was a, a transmitter specialist. Okay. Um, and worked and he worked for a group called Sarah track and, um, he'd been, he and I've been friends for years. And uh, he was showing me this little GPS tag that they were going to glue to the foreheads of seals because it was really streamlined, and it was about the size of a postage stamp. And we're sitting, drinking in a bar, watching the sea otters in Monterey Bay, probably more intoxicated than we needed to be, right? <laughs> this is when I was younger. And, and I looked at him, and I said, hey, that's pretty small. Why couldn't we build one of those for a turkey? So on a napkin... In this bar, we sketched out the design for the first ever turkey GPS unit. Oh, wow. So, and, and so then Chris took the design and went back to his company. And I went to a guy named Vernon Bevel. And anybody who's been with NWTF knows Vernon Bevel is. Um, I went to Vernon, who is with the Upland Game Bird, the, uh, the Game Bird program lead for Tech Sparks for Wildlife. And I told him, I was like, I need you to give me $13,245. <laughs> it's probably not going to work. But if it works, we're going to change how turkey science is done in the United States. He gave me the money. Um, we built the first ever GPS tag. Um, it was, oh, it was horrible looking. <laughs> it, was, it was big and it was fat. It was like two 
D batteries stacked on top of each other. We glued a VHF tag to the side of it. And um, we took it down to uh, the Temple Ranch, which was uh, Buddy Temple's property in South Texas. Uh, he had a land manager, uh, ranch manager named Robert Sanders, he's a good friend of mine, um, and, his, and his wife, Jenny, um, were down there and, and we caught a hen. Josh Guthrie was, Guthrie was a grad student's name. We caught this female, an adult female, and we put this jankety tag on her, okay? <laughs> and she was gone for, I don't know, 60 days, and she got predated, okay? And this is, you got to remember, like, we're, we're lifetimes from this right now, okay? Right. We were, everybody was tagging birds with VHF at yeah. this point still. Um, and we hadn't told anybody. So we get this tag back. Because we found her dead, right? Because it had a mortality signal on it. We bring the tag back. And we, he drives it all the way from South Texas to the office there at Texas A&M where I was at. And plug that sucker in. And there's computer program. You got to download the file and transform it. And we look at this file and we've got 460 locations, right? So a couple points. Here, right? So we have 460 locations over like a 40-day period. There are, there are theses out there that don't have 460 locations on turkeys. So I'm like, holy crap. So we get one of the GIS guys, a guy named Kevin Scow. I'm like, hey, come in here. Don't say nothing. Can you make a map of this for me? So he makes this map and he, he says, yeah, I see what's going on because everything had dates and times. He started connecting the dots. Here's what it did on Tuesday. And here's what it did on Wednesday. And here's what it did on Thursday. And then right then I knew we had it because we were moving from this VHF, this very high frequency telemetry idea where you'd go out and, and most of us, this is what we had done, right? Mm -hmm. Forever, you know? I mean, the only thing you get GPS on are like these huge deer collars, right? Where you'd go out and you'd get maybe one point on a bird a couple days a week and, and it would be in an area that's a few hectares, right. you know, like five or six acres is the, it's somewhere in that five or six acre area. And that's how we did things like habitat selection. That where you would hold up a yeah. Yeah. An antenna and direct. Yeah. Yes. You have a go. null peak antenna or you'd have a, a four element Yagi and you'd go to a spot and you'd, you'd like point it and you'd get a compass bearing and then you drive over somewhere else and you point again to this and guessing at this huge area then to now saying that bird's sitting on this table. Yeah. Right. Or, or in this room, for example, on the first tags. So, and multiple, multiple times a day, at multiple times a day. I think, I think we did like eight points a day on this first okay. bird, just test driving it out. Right. And this unit is mounted on her back backpack. Somehow. Yeah. It's a backpack style. It's like we do right now. You'll see them put up on social media all the time. Everybody's tying them on and everything They're, they're They, they ride kind of high on their shoulders between their wings. Um, and we do that because, um, turkeys, you guys will laugh, but turkeys are basically a mammal and how they move and how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They don't fly very much. Right. So they walk around, right? So, so they don't need to fly as much as, say, a sparrow does or, you know, a junco or, you know, a, a hawk or something like that. All the, so for a lot of those, you use what are called leg loop harnesses, and the tags sit much lower on their back, kind of almost above their butt. Um, but for turkeys, it makes more sense for us to put them up on their shoulders. And, and we do it specifically because that helps us get really good uh, signal from the satellites. Right. Okay. Um, you know, cause we can get real good. So, and, and technology has gotten a lot better now. So our tags are a lot smaller. I mean, these first tags were ridiculous. They were like putting a Coke can on the back. Yeah, that might, might could have, uh, have affected the way they traveled yes, around. Very and, much yeah. so. You but know. it was a good start. Your daughter's been begging you to hunt since her little brother shot the big eight last year. You've ran a fire, dissed the fields, got stuck, got unstuck, planted food plots, fertilized, and prayed for rain. You moved trees, limbed roads, even bought one of those fancy cell cameras. So what's your excuse? LS Tractor. Moultrie has pioneered the game management category. Today, Moultrie is one of the best-selling brands of feeders and seeders in the world, and they continue to innovate with new technology that gamekeepers will rely on. Moultrie products are always field-tested and designed for hunters by hunters, combining forward-thinking innovation with time-tested practicality. Moultrie, first in feeders since 1979. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site-wide discount at MoultrieFeeders.com. Use code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak, at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount.
So does she just preen that into her feathers? Absolutely. And she accepts it? Um, usually what happens is, is that they'll preen them down a little bit into their feathers, and, and they don't like them, I don't think, but they don't accept it. And we equate the tags. Uh, so just for scale, the historic tags we were using when we first started this would be about the same as a 200-pound person, you know, me, carrying a brick on my back all day long. Okay. Now it's about a third of a brick, like weight and mass and mm -hmm. size because technology gets better. Right. So, so we get these bird, this bird back and we get these dots and I'm like, oh, wow, we can figure out where this bird is going. So, so our alpha unit got us some static tests on accuracy, slapped on a bird. We got some points. So, so I emailed my friend, Mike Chamberlain, who, who was at uh, Louisiana state university at the time. And I said, Hey, I got something to show you. I need you to keep it quiet, but I think you need to, and I've, talking, I've still got the email. I, you need to come in on me with this because we're going to, this is going to change how we think about turkeys. And I sent him the map and a picture of the bird with a GPS tag on it. And I, and I said, give me a call and we'll talk. And if I, my memory is right, he called me pretty quickly thereafter. <laughs> and, and we got to talking about it because Mike and I had been professional colleagues and weren't, you know, we weren't friends like we are now, but we'd been, you know, professionally knew, knew who each other were. And the next year we put out, um, I put out like another 12 or 15 GPS in South Texas. Um, Mike put out, uh, and Jimmy Stafford, who's a retired tricky biologist in Louisiana, put out um, another maybe a dozen to test drive in Louisiana. And, and this is the old days, right? Mm -hmm. So to get the data back, the bird either had to die or you shot it. Mm -hmm. We absolutely shot birds off the roost. That's how important these data were because mm -hmm. every time we get data points back, we'd learn all kinds of new things. So now we don't even have to touch the birds. We can tag them and suck the data off of them. Mm -hmm. right? So when that happened, because the, the, the folks that kind of, you know, I don't want to say develop technology, but and I don't want to use the word revolutionize either, but change something, you're immediately out doing stuff nobody else can do. So now we're talking about what the daily speed of a turkey is what uh, resources they're using during the day, where they're roosting at every night no longer takes a graduate student to go out and find and guesstimate what roost tree they're in. We know exactly where they're at. We know where their nests are because the GPS points get stacked on top of each other. We know how many days they spent on a nest. We know how much time they spent off the nest when they're nesting. So, so it opened up a, a array of scientific behavioral management things that we were never able to do it was completely before. out of reach right they were completely out of reach. um one of the first things we did was how do turkeys respond to hunters we we artificially uh hunted birds on the temple ranch we had gps units on them. we cranked them up to collect points like every 50 minutes and we sent people down to simulate hunting activity to simulate what happens when you bust a bird off of a roost to to simulate you know disturbance um and uh you know to just start tweaking at some of these things that we then got a chance to do like full on in other studies. Um, and then that kind of um, steamrolled because you, you know, once you start collecting those data and making them available to your partners, right? Like to your, my, for me, it's the state agency partners and our federal partners with like forest service. Mm -hmm. um, then they want more because that, that tells a really good story being able to say, Hey, look, you know, so a hunter, for instance, and I, I love hunters, you know, hunters get so nervous about shooting our birds. They're, they're wild turkeys. We treat them as wild turkeys. You shoot one of my birds that's carrying a GPS tag. Don't not call me, <laughs> you know, call me. And not only will I let you likely keep the tag if you really want it for, you know, some people put them on mounts, but I'll make you maps of where the bird was at. That's I'll cool. show you what happened that morning. Right. Um, we, we want to get that information out there because it's a really good way for, scientists and, and academics to interact with the public. And, you know, like, that's not my job, right? Like I don't have an outreach component to my job. Like I'm supposed to do science and teach, like I'm not supposed to talk to people. Um, you know, so that, that gives us a, a way to um, easily engage and inform. And, and, you know, when you, when you show a hunter, here's what that bird did on the morning that you harvested it. Like, here's where you knew where you were at. Here's where it was at. And you show him three days earlier in the same spot and the bird in the same spot and the bird went the other way mm -hmm. and he didn't get it that morning. That's really interesting to them. Yeah. You know, so, so that kind of was the, the, the spur of my career 
And then, you know, then that led to bunches of graduate students, lots of projects, engagement, you know, obviously with NWTF um, and, and spending a lot of time, you know, um, I don't want to say preaching the gospel, but I mean, there was a time when there were only a couple of us studying turkeys. I mean, it was, it was Mike and I just kind of grind, struggling to grind through projects every year. And, you know, you have one over here and one over there. And now it's, uh, it's become a much bigger world. You know, and, and I like to think that the the, the the drunk at a bar in Monterey, California, with my friend Chris was probably one of the, and I'm trying to say this without sounding arrogant, is probably one of the spurring moments that's driven what we're doing with turkey conservation all across the United States now with the level of detail that we're doing yeah. it. So, well, that's excellent. Yeah, it really. You is. know, and, and I don't want to be like, oh, hey, look at me. And that's, <laughs> that, that, I'm completely the opposite of that. Like, I don't, I don't try, I try very hard not to operate like that, but but yeah, so it was a lot of fun, and you know, well, a lot of cool ideas are spurned on the on a napkin with a, a pen and a piece of paper and a beer. Yeah, <laughs> so, for sure. You know, but it's great now because now what what it's done is it's allowed scientists, any scientist working anywhere in the United States, to um, coordinate how we collect data, um, such that everybody's collecting the same information. Generally speaking the same way, right? So like things like um, information on say nest vegetation characteristics. Almost everybody that's studying turkeys now is collecting that information the same way. Uh, how fast do you take GPS locations? Almost everybody that's studying turkeys now is collecting that data the same way. I laugh, but you wanna know probably, you guys will laugh at this, you wanna know probably the strongest turkey data set in the world is right now? What's that? Roosting data, because everybody collects a data point at night. It's consistent across almost every study. There's probably 10 million roosting locations, maybe more, for wild turkeys in the United States available right now. That's probably the only data set that's, that's entirely consistent across every single study for the history of ever. Is it everybody? So there's there's probably at some point. I might need to take a look at that if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, trust me. At some point, somebody's going to probably compile all those points and be like, "Here's where turkeys roost at." You know, that's. But what you're alluding to is actually one of our biggest problems. Um, I, I say problem. It's not a problem, okay? But we get that a lot because hunters really want to know what's going on. And whenever we got piles of students in field in the field on our our public lands, our WMAs, our Forest Service property, and they run across our students out there tracking birds. First questions are, you know, hey, where are the birds at? Students are like, can't say that. You know, and it's not like we don't want to tell people what we're doing. It's, you know, there's an ethical responsibility we have as scientists. Absolutely. To, to defer, you know. Uh, so our, our standard response is, oh, they're over there in the woods. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. I'm, I'm glad That's you. kind of like, uh, where, you know, where's a good spot on this piece of land? Uh, uh, no, I, get that, uh, I get that all the time. <laughs> I got buddies, and I, I'm not going to out anybody. They're, they're here right now. But I got buddies that drew Clear Creek, WMA in Louisiana. Um, and I got some other ones that do um, uh, Big Lake. Um, and, a, uh, and the other one, uh, West Bay. And um, they're like, hey, where do I go? I was like, huh. Here's the area you yeah. go. I'm not telling you where the tag birds are at. It's, it, go here. Yeah. Follow this creek bottom. This, there's good birds in there, but, you know, I can't be specific. And, and you know, we want to do that, but, you know, like, we want to do it within reason. So, for instance, there's a we had a great project, um, Jay Cantrell and Charles Ruth from South Carolina DNR on the Web Center. We worked out there for five years. We tagged every hunter that we could that was going on the Web Center with a GPS unit. We had a whole bunch of GPS tag turkeys out there as well. And we actually looked and saw, we wouldn't tell the hunters where the birds were at, right? But we could see how the birds and the hunters would interact on the landscape and how the males would interact differently than the females. It was super, super cool. And Brad Cohen, uh, Tennessee uh, Tech, just uh, finished up an analysis working with one of the graduate students, um, Elena Ross. She's actually a Wisconsin DNR biologist now, showing how males shift their space use as hunting and pressure and intensity increases over the season, but how females show relatively no response, like hardly, which makes perfect sense, right? We're not hunting females. Mm. Can you, you know? can you, with this data, or do you see birds leaving these public areas and going to private non-pressured areas? I mean, you do see a little bit of that, but not as much as you would think. Um, you know, um, there are different kinds of turkeys uh, I've come to that conclusion in my life, looking at some of these data. It's not like the open day hunting season comes and everything runs for the fence lines. You know, you'll see some scoot off 
from highly pressured areas, but a lot of times they just get away from the hunters. Cause so the average, here's an interesting statistic. The average hunter rarely gets more than a couple hundred yards from a paved road ever on public land. And, and usually it's less than like 50 or 60 yards from a just dirt, you know, fire cut type of road. So the birds don't have to work too hard to get off from people, especially in, you know, your big blocks of national forest, you know, big blocks or your WMAs. They don't have to work hard for it. Um, there are some that, that will scamper. Absolutely. Um, but there are also birds that we've seen um, with GPS data that they're within 150 yards of a road their entire life. And hunters are all around them. They just stay quiet. They just don't make any noise is what we guess because they're not getting shot. And they'll be there the whole season. Hunters are all around them. And they just, they're just like, all right, I'm just going to sit here quietly and not do anything. <laughs> I'm just so many different personalities too. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and there's some work being done on that. There's, there's a, a student at the University of Georgia right now who's a, an animal personality type of, of person, I guess. Sorry, that didn't come out really well. But an, he's studying animal personality and using how these birds move to see if they can distinguish different uh, traits between them. And, and he's fairly early in his, his science. You know, he's writing his dissertation proposal right now, but he's got some neat ideas, you know. So you're going to ask him. I'm sorry. I didn't mean well, to cut you off. No, I was, I'm, just, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about if somebody kills a bird mm -hmm. with one of these units to yeah. call you. Call because, us. Because I could clearly see somebody shooting one and going, uh-oh, what did I, you know, I, what did I just do? But – I guess you guys could track the bird back to the guy's house if you wanted, if you oh, needed to. Yes. Normally what happens is if somebody gets nervous, they cut the tag off and throw it in a ditch. That's that's par for the course. You know, um, we don't we don't see a ton of poaching. We see a little bit. Um, but we don't see like a ton of out of season poaching. Um, but normally if somebody we think what happens is somebody gets nervous, they 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 think they've done something wrong and they'll cut the tag off and just dump it. But the bird's also got a leg band on it. And it's got a, and on the tag it says call us. I mean yeah. mm -hmm. People, so, have, people have to understand, I don't own turkeys, okay? Like, like just because a turkey exists on your private property does not make it yours, right? It's owned by the public. It's managed by the state for the benefit of the public. That's a public bird. When you reduce that public resource to private possession, that's not wrong, and there's no reason you should feel worried because it happened to have a leg band on it or because it happened to have a backpack on it. Call us. Well, and we just want it. We want the the science. Yeah. I want the data. Harvesting a turkey is data. Yes. You know, or whether a yeah. predator gets it or a hunter gets yes. it, that's a data. It's point. data. It's a data point. I'd rather know that you harvested the bird and have that, that be able to classify it as a known harvest than classifying it as an unknown because that's a loss of information for me. Yeah. Because I don't know if it was predated, I don't know if it was shot, I don't know if it was poached, I don't know if it got hit by a car or anything. So, so yeah, we encourage, and we're, you know, we encourage, you know, like um, uh, Cody uh, Sedato, who's the turkey biologist in Louisiana, you know, people call him all the time whenever they harvest birds with our bands on it. And he sends certificates to everybody, which is, you know, he didn't have to do it, but he's got a certificate that he prints out with all the information and we send, he sends that to everybody and then we follow up as best we can. Yeah, that's a trophy. With, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, yeah. you shoot, if you shoot a bird with a GPS unit on it or even a band on it, I mean, that's a huge trophy in the United States because, I mean, relative to waterfowl, I mean, we probably don't ban, but a few thousand turkeys in the U.S. a year. I mean, not that many, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's some states doing a lot of banning research now, so maybe it's ramped up a little bit, but less than 10,000 probably total in the United States. I mean, heck, that's, what, a fifth of what they put out for mallard bands every year? So do you have any stories of guys harvesting one of these birds and taking it back home and not telling you? And you yes. And you, and you <laughs> yes. Um, you know, my job is not law enforcement. <laughs> How's that? And, and the students that we've got, um, if, if someone shoots a bird, we, we run around with our antennas running, you know, where we're driving around, we, cause you never know if birds get squirrely or get lost or anything like that. So if we're driving, the antennas are on and they're just cycling through all of the different frequencies, right? Every once in a while you get a ping on a bird that you lost and it'll be in a subdivision or, you know, in, in somebody, you know, it'll be, it, it's obviously in somebody's house or out in their garage or, you know, thrown thrown behind the wood, the tags thrown behind the wood pile out back of their house. That does happen. Um, but we don't, we, our intention is not to penalize people. That's not at all what we're doing. You know, we just want the tag back. We just want the data off the tag back. Um, now we've had situations where birds have been poached 
and and state agencies have used our approximate location because I don't want any part of that. Like that's not my role in life is mm-hmm. not to do that. We'd be like, it's over here. Here's its frequency. We're out. And and then the state conservation officers will usually take it from there, especially if you know it's a a situation. I, I can think of one situation, state unnamed where someone had obviously pulled up on a flock of birds that had three or four tag birds in it and just 12 gauged all of them. I mean, just boom, 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 you know, and killed every bird out there. And because three or four of the tags were at one site, oh, wow. that doesn't happen. So we turn that over to the conservation officers and we just kind of walk away. Um, because that's also, you know, you don't want anybody in the public to think that we're actively targeting people as academics, right? Like that's not what we do, but we also have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility to the resource and to the rest of you who are also public users of the resource that, you know, somebody shoots three or four tag birds. We got to let the conservation officers know about it. So, and I'm not saying, and it's pretty rare. It's poaching is really rare for us. I will say that right now. I can count on one hand, the number of birds that I've lost to poaching in the last 10 or 11 years and maybe two, but no more than that. That's you know, good. most yeah. most turkey hunters, and and you know this, we're all incredibly passionate about it, um, and the and even more passionate about the resource and all this new GPS data that you guys have figured out, uh, and being able to make it so much more accessible to all of us. I mean, we're we're eating it up. Yeah, so it, it's so keep, cool. Yeah, keep doing it, and you know, you've been talking about these names, and you know, I don't I don't recognize half of those names. <laughs> And that's a good thing, you know. There's so many more people out there studying turkeys and upland birds and nesting and survival and where are they going, where are they, you know. Yeah, the younger so generation. We're, we're eating is, it up. Yeah, the younger the younger generation. Because I'm, I mean, <laughs> Mike uh, Chamberlain is at the University of Georgia, and I were laughing a while back. We we realized that we're now the old guys. It, it didn't used to be. It used to be we'd go into a room and you know. You'd have, you know, Bill Healy and, you know, Bill Porter, you know, sitting around and, you know, you'd have, you know, James Earl would be hanging out in there and Tom Hughes and, you know, you'd have, you know, I mean, you got folks like Chad Lehman out in South Dakota, you know, this is probably about our age. I mean, we're in, in the academic realm, we're the old guys. I mean, there's nobody that we know of that's really older than us that's like studying Turkey. So, and now we're kind of like, I don't, I don't want to say the grandfather, although I probably got enough gray getting there, but we're, we're kind of turning into like the grandfatherly people of these meetings. Mm-hmm. And, and it's great because when we were coming up, it was literally just us. And now the, the, the foundation is much broader. You know, you, you've got, I mean, I can, I don't want to rattle off a bunch of names, but you've got graduate students that are coming out from you know, our group and others that, you know, they're taking over agency jobs. Sorry, all my kids are trapping turkeys right now. So they're, they're sending me all kinds of maps and pictures and updates on trapping this morning. So I apologize. My phone's going off. No, I'm going It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So this is real world right now. You know, but you get, you know, you, you get these kids that are now, I mean, managing turkeys in, in Indiana and in Arkansas and in Texas and in Wisconsin and, you know, you got kids who are, or I say kids because they're 25 years younger than me, right? But they're they're doing postdocs now at, at Tennessee Tech, or you know, they're you know, you got people like Brad Cohen, who's one of the up and comers right now uh, down at Tennessee Tech, who's working with um, uh, the folks at Tennessee Wildlife Resource Group, and and mm-hmm. also with Kentucky doing a big banding project, and he's got a project going on there. You've got um, what Andy Little out in Nebraska who is doing a bunch of, of really cool stuff um, that, that's starting up with, with doing the Nebraska. So there's a, there's a nice kind of younger cohort um, that's, that's, you know, starting to, to catch birds. You know, you got Marcus Lashley, who's working down in Florida, and, you know, Will Gullsby's in there down at, at uh, Auburn University. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's just this, you know, um, oh, the guy in Maine, uh, I'll, his name will come to me, I'm sorry, Eric Blomberg. Um, who's up at Maine, who's done some really neat work, right? So so there's this nice younger generation out there that's that's kind of coming online. And it's, I don't want to say it's easier for them now. I think it is because all the struggles that that we had, like tags that you couldn't remotely download, right? That's not a problem any of these people mm-hmm. face. You know, I mean, I, I have students now that collect more locations in a day 
than we used to collect in, you know, weeks and whenever we were first test driving the stuff. So as technology's got better, it's allowed a lot more people to come underneath the the umbrella and it's really strengthening what we know about turkeys. Right. You know? And, and that's pretty cool. And like, you know, we can talk bad about social media, but uh, you know, fifteen years ago, if you wanted to read about wild turkeys, yep. you had to go to a uh, land grant universities website the extension and find the yep. find the professors and click on the publications yep. and read them now they're able you know they're like uh the social media is like a liaison yeah and you can you can use that social media to get all of these publications and you can put them at a level that we can understand them yeah no um, and, and people and yeah you're right it's just so much more accessible now uh, hunters crave information because they want to know why the animals are doing what they're doing, right? I mean, that's that's part of our nature, right? We want, we want to understand the birds um, in this case. And, and you know, social media is good and bad. Um, sure. And, and, I, and I'll caveat that, you know, um, it's provided, like, like Mike's done a great job in outreach, um, you know, with, with his work, with, um, you know, building up his uh, his Instagram account and, and putting out the science that, I mean, and our science is fully merged. So it's his science, my science, our science, you know, putting out the information we're getting on that is great. I, I don't do that, but I'm the editor for a wildlife journal right now. And, and I, that puts me in a weird ethical place. Sure. Because if I were to say something on social media, that's, I say X and then somebody wants to publish a paper in my journal that says Y and I were to happen to reject it, I could put myself in an ethical quandary. Mm -hmm. So I don't publish a lot of, put a lot of stuff out on social media. Right. Um, but it get, it gets us to a place where there's actually able to be direct interaction. And I think that's what I enjoy the most about the, the, the social media outreach in that, um, we can, we can put something out there and explain something. Um, and you know, uh, Gobbling. I think Mike published one on gobbling data the other day um, and talk about why birds don't gobble out. Like that's a fallacy. Everybody swears it's true, but it's not. We've got data for multiple, it's a fallacy, okay? And then whenever people ask questions, we can respond. And that I think is the, the real utility of, of the social media angle that people get into is that there's, they get to recognize that Brett Collier is somebody they can send an email to and ask him a question and I'll answer. It may take me a day sure. to get to it, but yeah, if you send me a question about a turkey, I'm going to send you a response back. Or they can, they can ping me on social media and say, Hey, I saw you, you know, I heard your podcast that you did, you know, and, and I got a question on this topic and I'll get back to you. And we didn't used to have that. Right. Right. I used to have to go knock on the door knock at on the Thompson door. Hall or leave yes. a voicemail and, and it would work, but, it's not, it's a lot of the masses didn't quite. But, but, and the B is there's a record of it too, right? Because if I answer your, because if you ask a question, there's a thousand other people that have the same question. Right. Right. And they get that and they get that answered. So I find that to be a, a huge boon for social media. One of the downsides of it, because you can do, you know, positive and negative is that there's an awful lot of people that purport expertise on topics that don't have them. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, we see that all the time. And my problem is that I don't want to be a gatekeeper, gatekeeper, excuse me, of, of turkey science, right? Um, but but sometimes things get said that are just flatly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... Or misinterpreted. Misinterpreted, um, you know, maybe not taken in the right context. And in those type of cases, social media is also beneficial because you can provide appropriate context rapidly as opposed to what would happen in the old days when everybody would go to drop their deer off at, you know, the processors and you all gab about what was going on with the deer herd, you know, the deer in your area at the processors. Right. So there's a real nice give and take and, and, you know, a social media is not without its problems. Don't get me sure. wrong. Right. <laughs> um, but, but, um, it's, it's really a useful outreach mechanism and, you know, there are things I would like to do. I would like to do more of, I think that social media is a little bit short form sometimes mm -hmm. as I sit here just blabbing. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it's a little short form sometimes because, you know, what can you get in 350, 400 words on a, a little Instagram post or a video that like you couldn't do better in five or six minutes? And I'll give you guys a great example um, because this will come up probably in the next couple of days. Um, Steven Spurlock with Chasing 49 is a really good friend. Of sure. Mine. I love Steven. He's awesome. Yeah, we all love Steven. I, I called him the other day. I was like, I got something for you. One of my grad students, Chad, shot a video of how to process a turkey because we needed something that we could just have 
so that we could show people and like, well, how do you take the blood sample? Well, here's this. So I sent it to Steven and I said, hey, can you make this pretty? Because I, I don't do that, right? Like that's, I, I'll do some calculus for you if you need it done, Stephen, but mm -hmm. I can't do it. And he's gonna make a video, take our video that Chad uh, Argerbride, who's one of my PhD students, shot. And he's gonna break it into, okay, here's how you take a bird out of a box. Here's how you put the sock on its head. Here's how you physically hold the bird so that it's safe. Here's how you put the bands on so that other people will have a resource that they can use whenever they say, okay, well, how do we have to angle the needle for bleeding these birds as an example? But also, that's now a, a, an eternal video of a process that any person of the 50 or so thousand people that are going to be here can now look at and be like, oh, that's how they put the leg bands on. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, that's how they take the blood sample for that genetic stuff that they're taking. Or, oh, why are they taking a the feather sample off of them? Oh, we're talking through it. Yeah. And, and very I think accessible. That, that accessibility is what is so great about social media. Um, and it, it's kind of like I would read a publication, uh, but... I can get all the layman's term stuff just reading the abstract and yep. I skip all the discussion and you know I don't I don't <laughs> typically go through all the 20 pages. No, you I shouldn't. just read the abstract that talks about what happens. Yeah. And uh to me that's that's kind of like an analogy for what uh, we're getting on social media. 100%. And you're exactly right is that scientists I I do not write papers for the average turkey hunter. That's not a criticism of the average turkey hunter. That's no. that's my job. My job is to write papers that interpret data the best possible way, right? As do all turkey biologists. Social media provides us the ability to um, reduce the jargon to the and, and reduce the amount of nuance that we put in those papers to get information out to the public. Because at the end of the day, we work for the public. Like I work for the state of Louisiana. I work for the public in the state of Louisiana. If somebody emails me a question, I'm going to answer it. Um, but it's... You don't want to be complicated. Does Absolutely. that make sense? So if we can, I, I, I'm not like dumb it down is not what I'm going at. It's it's take it off of the scientific pedestal of a p value and a test statistic and a regression function and say here's what it means to the average person. And that's that's a huge utility. Oh, absolutely. Because I, I had no clue what you were talking about when you yeah. said p value. <laughs> you know. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the all new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed for everywhere. Have you heard about the LS Gamekeeper tractor giveaway? That's right, we're handing over one of our Gamekeeper used LS tractors and believe us, the team isn't thrilled about saying goodbye. This powerhouse comes equipped with a front loader, belly mower, backhoe, and tiller, making it the ultimate camp tractor with unmatched versatility. It comes with a certified pre-used warranty straight from LS, and the Gamekeeper's crew has given it their stamp of approval. Don't miss out. Head over to MossYokeGamekeepers.com to discover all the ways you can throw your hat in the ring. Let me ask this as a guy who who is into math, hmm? And uh, it, obviously, you're a smart guy. I don't know about all that. We'll just say into math and leave it there. <laughs> so, could you back us up? And so, somebody listening to this, that this spring is going to be sitting there, and all of a sudden, a turkey's going to walk up there at 30 yards, and they're about to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Just something that they can think about at that moment of statistically how low the the probability is that that bird. Exists. Exists. Yeah. Yes. Could you walk? We've heard we've heard a little bits, but I'd love sure. to hear your side of that. All right. So turkey population biology 101 in a in a rapid sense. Okay. Uh, every turkey's a miracle. Every male turkey that gets harvested every year is a miracle. Just just flat out. I mean, it just is. Just getting them there. Mm -hmm. So so here's what has to happen. So turkey, we we y'all, everybody's on here's probably heard turkeys have a really complex social structure. Um, they they have a dominance hierarchy where the females select the males that they're going to breed with. And, um, the, the males are not interchangeable. Okay. So it's not like if male one disappears, they all go to male two. They, they reshuffle and there's, you know, all kinds of fighting that goes on. The females have to select somebody. So, so once a bird, a female, I'm going to just jump to the point is bred. Okay. Um, the old days we used to think that she could store sperm for, you know, 
60 days in some cases, 30 was thought in others. It's probably a couple weeks before the sperm are, you know, inviable, you know, are, are no longer useful um, before she starts nesting. Um, so she's going to put an egg on the landscape in a place she's never been to before. That's important. So she didn't scout this place out. Basically, she's never seen it before. And she's going to suddenly say, oh, there's a bush. I'm going to go nest underneath that. And she's going to put an egg on the landscape. And then she's going to walk away. And she's going to do that for about 14 days. Um, she'll put about 12 eggs in, 11, 12. And they skip a couple of days in there. Um, and she's going to put the eggs down in the ground. And then while those eggs are sitting there and she's laying, you know, in this laying period, she's wandering around all around the area around her nest because she's never been there before. She doesn't know what kind of resources are there. Okay. Um, so she has no idea where the food is. She has no idea where water is. She has no idea if there's a bunch of predators there. She just landed in a, you know, a, a you know, coyote factory, <laughs> um, you know, or, or Bobcat Haven or whatever you want to call it. Um, or if there's good resources over here and bad resources over there. We very rarely lose nests during the laying period, like very, very rarely. I mean, most of the time they get left alone. I mean, I mean it's less than a couple of percent, okay? Then she's going to go and she's going to sit on that nest, all right? Now, this is when things start getting crazy. Only about 65, call it, 65%, somewhere between 65 and 70% of those hens are going to live through the reproductive season because they get eaten, bobcats and coyotes. So right? just, li they're living they through the... killed. Dead. So, so six, so basically we'll call it seven, seven of every 10 females that attempts to nest survives. Okay. So, so that means if you got a hundred birds out there, a hundred females out there, only 70 of them are going to be alive at the end of the nesting season of those 70 that are nesting. Not all 70 of them are nesting, right? But let's say they are, um, 80% of those nests are going to fail. So 56 off the top of my head, 56 of those 70 nests are going to fail right out of the gate. They're just going to die. Something's okay. going to, and, and the cause is something either eats the female, right? While she's incubating or um, something causes the female to abandon the nest site, trying to eat the female mm -hmm. generally. Okay. And then something else come in and clean up the scavenge, the eggs. Okay. And that's a whole nother topic on the difference between a predation and scavenging. We'll get to that in a minute. So whatever's left, Okay, it ends up being about 20% um, of the nests actually hatch, let's call it. But maybe 10% to 15% of those are actually going to successfully raise a brood to 28 days to 30 days to about four weeks because we track them, right? So on average, from every 100 nests you have, you might get half a dozen broods, a brood consisting of at least one poult every year. Now, these are real general numbers, sure. okay? but, but on average. So when you see that male out there, that's a miracle that given how much, you know, we know about how many hens are lost and what the nest uh, predation rates are, or sorry, the hen predation rates and the scavenging rates on nests and, and the mortality rates of hens and the mortality rates of poults and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we look at uh, things like a uh, uh, poult per hen counts, right? That's a pretty standard, you know, index. And, you know, we think that around three is about where we need to be. So we're in a three to four range. Um, we're generally below that right now. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that puts us, I mean, turkey populations have generally declined across a lot of the United States, not everywhere. I had a great talk with Hannah from North Carolina and she says they were looking really good. They said they were pretty population harvest was still going up. Populations were stable. Um, so a lot of the other places in the United States have seen declines. So it's a real difficult thing to, to get a turkey on the landscape, you know, and, and I, and, and that, that's not saying that that's the average bird that we're catching tags on. There are going to be birds that, I mean, we've got some birds that, you know, hatch out first in the beginning of the year. Man, they're running around with 12 poults, you know, two months later because we happen to see them. Awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But there's an awful lot of birds that are zero. Mm -hmm. And so when you average it out, you get that, you know, a couple, you know, per hen. Um, so it's it's tough being a, a turkey on the landscape. It, it just really, really is. And and if you're lucky enough to get that male to come in at 30 yards and not 
see you or hear you or if you're like me messing around and trying not to make a mistake man cherish that moment because that i mean that's really what it's about and there was a lot of effort put into growing that guy two years ago so yeah and boy do we cherish it <laughs> yeah they're a lot of fun did, did i answer your question it, it did I, and it we're just amazed at, at, at what it takes and it, has it always been as difficult as it is now no i don't think so um so during restoration, um, well, obviously we weren't hunting birds, right? So, because I mean, the, the the biggest, and this is not going to be a shock to anybody listening to this, but you know, the number one cause of mortality of wild turkeys is a shotgun. That's just how it is, right? For males, right? Um, so during restoration, production was a lot higher. Um, there's some there's differing opinions out there on on whether these birds are too crowded. You know, whether there's there's too much density, you know, and, and they're not able to find usable space, whether it's, you know, there's some other limitation. Um, but, but generally, you know, for most of, not to get overly population biology on you, but for most critters that you take to a new area and you dump out and there's nothing else like them there, they tend to expand the, the really rapidly, right? And we saw that with turkeys, right? Mm -hmm. we, saw, we saw with turkeys, we saw with deer, you know, I mean, we, we see that kind yeah, of we've stuff. Yeah, we've discussed that in the past. Yeah. And it, it's an interesting topic. Right. And, you know, um, and, and I think what happens is, I don't want somebody to say I think this, but I, I think what happens is, is that um, landscape changes have changed as a whole, you know, regionally in the United States. It's made, you know, we've seen increased fragmentation of our vegetative communities um, through everything from, you know, urbanization to, you know, change in agricultural practices. You know, we don't have, I mean, I grew up on a, you know, cornered bean farm. I mean, you know, we had fence rows that were actually fence rows, right? I mean, they had bushes and grass mm -hmm. and everything down the sides of them. Now it's, it's fence boy, it's field clean border, as a field whistle. border, clean as a whistle. We don't even need a fence. We got a GPS unit, right? Um, and then, you know, I see some of that's changed. Um, Forestry management's changed, um, you know, uh, you know, getting to 27 years on, you know, loblolly, chipping wood and board and that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's changed what our, some of our forests look like. Um, you know, there's a lot of silver bullet talk, I'll be honest with you, that I hear a lot lately. It's, oh, it's this, it's that, it's, you know, I mean, you get into, it's got to be disease, it's got to be even freaking aflatoxin, it's got to be you know, uh, they're not able to breed, it's lower sperm counts, it's whatever, you know, but we don't really, we don't really see a lot of that stuff. Um, so I think that it's, it's death of a thousand cuts, mm, you know, just a lot of, a different lot of little things is what happens. Um, but interestingly, if you look back at the data, almost every state, and, and I hate to act like there are Turkey populations within states, right? There's one population of turkeys in the united states mm -hmm. i mean we can all this subspecies stratification they can all breed each other okay mm -hmm. so there's one turkey population in the united states it's turkeys um we can categorize them out however we want but you know like eco regionally you know we see that post-restoration everybody hits about the same point on the growth curve about the same time and that's telling us that that we're hitting perhaps a limit. I'm just not sure I know what is limiting, you know. And 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 there's been a lot of us that have had a lot of discussions on this. And I'm I'm on the kind of I think the turkey populations are are density independent. And I don't want to overly science you guys, but that that they they operate without density effects like it doesn't matter how many turkeys on the landscape they're going to find food they're going to find nesting cover that kind of stuff other people think that they are density dependent and and we don't have a good answer for that because we don't know we don't even know how to answer it right it's it's a theoretical context that nobody has a good answer for um but it's pretty uh you know everybody ends up in the same place at the same time on post-restoration growth before it starts to turn over a little bit so i don't know maybe there is something there you know are you surprised that some of the states still have like a fall season where a guy could shoot a hen or even that some states allow a guy to shoot a bearded hen Should, okay so, shouldn't we think about that and <laughs> all right i'm on I, so for the record <laughs> and, I'm, I'm, no, and, I, and i'll take any heat on this you got that people want to throw at me i am a hundred percent against shooting females period end of story the reason the reason that 
uh, bearded hens are legal is because of um, the the or the it's reason misidentification misidentification and conservation officers okay right? but but biologically it makes zero sense to me to say we can go shoot so everybody's populations are generally not everybody most populations are generally declining right um, or right. what possible reason is there to shoot a female in the fall just no. I mean, it, it has no positive benefit to the population. It only can hurt it. Theoretically, I don't even think it could be neutral at that point because if she were to, if you know, one female, if you shoot a thousand females and one of them had one poult, that's a positive effect the next year, right? So it's got to have a negative impact. Um, I don't think we should shoot females. And this is, I mean, man, I, I hunt a lot. So I don't even say, oh, he's just some tree hugger that does. No, it's from a, Purely population management standpoint, I don't have any logical reason that we could should shoot females. Now, I'm not for closing fall seasons, okay? Because um, I believe in in having availability of recreational activities and opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's great. I mean, and to be honest, turkey hunting used to be a fall sport. It wasn't the spring sport that it is now. I mean, whenever I mean, people hunt turkeys in the fall, you know, you're going to bust them up with dogs and stuff, and that's how you hunted them, right? Mm -hmm. Spring season has really only been a thing for like 50 years. 50 or 60 years. Um, I'm not a fan of shooting females. and um, But I like the idea of having a fall season. But the problem, I think, comes in is, I'm going to get murdered over this <laughs> one. Most hunters aren't able to separate juvenile males and juvenile females based on physical, morphological characteristics in that fall season. So they can't tell the difference between a Jake and a Jenny. Yeah. And, and that's probably why we keep make females available. But, so, you, but you know, so the, yeah. like, but you go into the spring yeah. and you, you mentioned that, that misidentification is, but we're also as a duck hunter, we're out there identifying, we've got to identify at the While crack the of air. dawn, but <laughs> something flying by and it's just a silhouette when you're trying to, I mean, you've got to identify that duck, mm -hmm. oh. and sometimes whether it's a male or female. Because so I remember the point system we used to be in. You know, you shoot one yes. duck, or like, shoot one canvas back. You better not be in the blind. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you have got to identify that mm -hmm. duck. So there's, I don't, I, don't, I think a guy should be able to identify the turkey. Oh, no, I, I, I agree. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just saying. I, I think the only difference, or the you know, the answer you get is that so few hens are taken. Mm -hmm that it's statistically insignificant, but that doesn't necessarily make it right. Well, you know, that's yeah, kinda, well, you know, and th that's a, no, and that's a valid argument. You know, we, we've looked at a lot of banding data and, and hen, female harvest is not um, very high. Fall harvest is actually going down a lot. I mean, it's, it's declining leaps and bounds across the United States. So at the broader scale, it's probably not a population limiting factor, but it's not helping. Correct. Just, just caveat that right now. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not, it's not, there's, it has no positive impact uh, other than a little recreational opportunity. Um, going back to your thing on, on identifying birds. Uh, yeah. I mean, I agree a hundred percent, you know, and, and you know, your duck analogy is a good one because I use it in my upland game bird ecology class. when I talk about timing of turkey seasons, right? Um, because like turkey seasons are timed at the peak of reproductive activity. Like when the male should be breeding the females. Could you imagine, could you imagine the, uproar if we open duck seasons in june or may <laughs> in south dakota because that's what we do for turkeys right yeah, yeah. i mean we we, we hunt tur the when we hunt turkeys is the equivalent of shooting ducks in may in south dakota when we're trying to make babies i, I would love to go hunt pintails and you know in the dakotas and canada and may bear with me here so so when you think about that corollary you know it's it's a it's interesting you brought up ducks because they're the perfect example I use in my classes on the difference of being able ideas, being able to tell the difference between a male and a female in the gray, in the morning, on the wing, when they're fine. There are people that can do it. I've hunted with some guys in Louisiana that, you know, they'll see birds two miles out and be like, ah, oh, it's a three gadwall and a model duck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, but you know, I'm, I'm against female harvest. Um, but, you know, there's also going to be – it's going to happen occasionally, but I think it's really, really low. Um, but I also get to sit back, and that's a, that's probably a good point I should make. I don't, I don't make policy. 
you know, my job as a scientist is to interpret data and, and as an academic is to interpret data, provide information and then give it to policymakers. So like, I don't go to the LDWF commission meetings in, in Louisiana unless I happen to get invited, which is honestly pretty rare and make recommendations on policy. That's not my job. My job is to do the science that then supports policy decisions. So, you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife, we did a big study with Jason Harden, and I mean, we banded so many females. Oh my God. Tons of female Rio Grande wild turkeys, tons of them. Harvest rates like nine one hundredths of a percent. Doesn't matter. Okay. We estimated it. It doesn't matter. If they want to shoot females, they can shoot females. It's not going to have any impact on anything because they got a million females running around out there and they're shooting like 900 a year, you know, or a couple of thousand a year. So it just, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's a interesting place to be as a scientist because I don't influence policy, I, but I do influence policy. Right. But, but like, I don't, I don't like, I don't go somewhere and say, you should do this. I say scientifically or numerically, or you, we don't need to do this, but whatever decisions made, I don't make it. So it's hopefully you have some influence on that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that I do, but I also, I also try not to, right? Because when you start, I mean, when you start advocating for a particular point of view, notice whenever we were talking about this, I said, I'm against mm -hmm. shooting females. Population biology wise, it probably doesn't matter, but I'm against it. I don't advocate because if you advocate, then you become a freaking James Kroll, Dr. Deer guy. And you know, that's, it's more about the, the advocacy and not about the actual conservation of the species. So I think that I've had to, and most of us do this. We spend our career walking that fine line of trying to provide the best science because once you start advocating for something, then you, you lose the scientific unbiasedness that is basically your only ethical defense, right? As soon as I start saying, no, we have to do it like this, then I'm no longer unbiased. That's a tough line to walk. It's ridiculously tough and, and it's hard to do. And I've, you know, all of us have, it's all of us in our position at some point have had to step back and be like, I, I just can't comment on this. Right. I just, I don't, ha I've got an opinion, but I. Well, and, and every, I mean, I think that everybody's interested in hearing your mm -hmm. opinion and it helps to. To, for the people that are making these policies, they've got to be able to hear that from you. And it, it interests me, you mentioned a minute ago that the pop, there's really just one population. Yeah. And we've got state borders and we've got mm -hmm. county borders. But through the years as we've done this podcast, we've, we, uh, you know, our, our, look, we're very passionate turkey hunters. We love them. But we've also been trying to kind of educate guys that, okay, well, maybe this state says you can shoot four. Mm-hmm. But in your where your hunting club is, you guys need to recognize if there is a problem, and maybe you need to self-regulate yourself yep. and just say, "Okay, we're just going to do two. We're gonna, we're just going to kill, kill." And it may be just something that you do on your property, but then you can travel to another part of the state and kill your other birds. But but we're just trying to make people aware, yeah, that they need to think about those things themselves. And I wanted to ask you, how do you? I don't expect you to disagree with me right. on that at all, but it from where you started mm -hmm. as a turkey biologist to where we are today, does it make you kind of pause uh, and think, well, we're not headed in a good direction here? Or, or what? What are your? How do you feel about the turkey population, the state of the general? turkey? Yeah, the state of the turkey. Well, you know, going back to the population question, all right. The, for everybody who's listening, everybody's like, no, no, Osceolas are definitely different than Goulds. You can drop a, a male and a female in a pen, and they're going to make babies. All right? There's there's nothing physiologically different, okay? It's not like we're dropping a deer in an elk. Yeah, it's a okay? white oak from it's, Florida it, it, and a, yes, a white oak from Missouri. So from a purely population standpoint, they're all the same bird, right? They can all, and that's the definition, right? They all interbreed. You know, they may not be in the same spot, but they, they sure can, right? Um, to your question on where we're at, you know, I think we're in a good spot. And, and here's why. There are so many people advocating for so many different angles of turkey conservation within the United States that it's got a lot of attention 
by our, our state agency folks, our federal partners, you know, because the federal government has a lot of land, right? Um, and and by being open with the science and open with the research and, and open with the outreach and, and admitting that there are there are things that we know we don't know and there are things that we don't know we don't know, right? There are unknown unknowns out there that that's put, you know, I think turkey conservation and the future of turkey conservation in a pretty good pretty good place. Um, you know, and, and you know, I don't want to pick on like quail, all right, but like quail are in a horrible situation right now. But they don't have anywhere near the advocacy for them that turkeys do. There's not a quail meeting that rolls 60,000 people into it on a Friday, Saturday, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? It doesn't happen like that. So, so, you know, when you think about everybody here is an advocate for turkeys. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, long term, you know, we're going to be in a good situation. I think that the use of social media, to go back to your question, actually plays a role in what you were mentioning about guys and uh, their property and whatnot and self-regulation. Okay. Um, I'm never going to tell somebody not to go hunt, you know, but people need to recognize that, you know, there's, um, every place has got some level of capacity for the number of individuals it can have on it. And that changes over time. You know, you can have birds in your backyard in December, they're gone in March. And, and people will talk about that all the time. It's because, you know, they move from their winter flock areas to the reproductive areas and they're just in different spots. And I think that people, you know, are starting to self-regulate. We see a lot of it. We get a lot of people commenting, you know, um, that they're not shooting as much or as many birds. And, and there's also the other side of the coin where people put up, you know, my, you know, I'm not going to pick it up, up. I and my ex other person here, you know, we both doubled this morning and shot four birds on our 19 acres and people just rail those folks on social media. Yeah. It's like, how greedy can you be? And I'm not saying that that's greedy or not greedy. I'm not judgmental. Right. Um, but I think that, that the, the conservation advocacy that you get from the people that are here actually lends towards self-regulation. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I try to self-regulate. Um, I can't. I can't think of a time when I've shot more than one bird in any state that I've hunted in. And I'm, I'm also probably not the best turkey hunter in the world. I'll fully admit that. I guarantee I'm a better turkey catcher than anybody listening to this. <laughs> probably not the best turkey hunter in the world. Um, you know. But but I think that a lot of people do, and I think the ones that are passionate about it, the ones that are passionate about the resource and passionate about conservation, they're the ones that probably regulate the best. Um, but I don't think that we should criticize people that don't, you know, I mean, resources are, I mean, they're public resources. And as long as they're putting in the, the grind and the time and the effort, yeah, I think they could, you know, potentially harvest what they are. I, the ones that I think get a little weird is like, you know, we've got a hundred acres and we want to shoot, you know, we got 19 tags this year. What do we do? It's like <laughs> burn 15 of the tags, <laughs> you know, and maybe you'll get lucky on a couple of the other ones. Um, but you know, so from all the years of your research on the turkey, as a turkey hunter, is there something that you've learned through the years that you can apply to your turkey hunting that you learned through the, all your research? Oh, man. That you could, that's, we can give a guy a tip listening to this. Oh, man, yeah. Um, I'll quote my, probably my best friend in the world, a guy named Ryan Miller. He's, he's in Illinois. And um, I'm, I'm going to have to tell him that I quoted him on this so he can listen to it. Um, so we were deer hunting one day. And he was up on one side of the farm and I was on the other. And I looked out and I was like, hey, there's a couple of deer running across the field. And he responds back to me. He's like, yep, sometimes they go left, sometimes they go right. And, and what I would probably say is that um, there's no average turkey. Um, every individual is different. Um, some days you're going to, you know, some days you're going to catch the bear. And you're going to get out there and you're going to have five birds full, just drop down in front of you full on ready to go. And some days you're going to have five birds drop in front of you and they're all going to run away from you as fast as they can. Um, what I've noticed most, and this is dead serious, is that hunters move too fast. We move too fast and we move too often. We have seen regularly in studies where we've GPS tagged hunters and GPS tagged turkeys 
that a hunter will be working a bird in the morning, like first thing in the morning, you know, or we assume they're working them, right? Listening to them, to them gobble or whatever it is. And, and the hunter's sitting there and like the bird's 80 or 100 or 120 yards off. And, and the hunter will be banging away or whatever it is. And then the bird will get down and the bird will move maybe 50 or 75 yards. And the hunter will leave and the bird will then 45 minutes later walk and be standing exactly where the hunter is. I think hunters get impatient is my point. Mm-hmm. They get impatient that they're not hearing the bird calling back to them or something. And they don't realize that bird's creeping back around. And we've got, I mean, we've got GPS tag birds and hunters that we've watched do this, you know? Um, so I, I think that, that what I've learned is patience r- has benefited to me that if I'm working a bird in the morning or in the afternoon for that matter, and, and I hear it move off and go quiet, I, I just lock up, you know, I lock up. I don't call, I don't, just bang away at my call and everything. I just lock up and I just sit there and I give it 30 or 45 minutes, maybe an hour, just real quiet every, you know, maybe 10 or 12 minutes. And it's helped me a couple of times, you know, but when you see it on GPS data pretty regularly, yeah. You know, so it's, it's common for people to, you know, you hear him gobbling off in the distance and you think he's gone forever mm-hmm. into the abyss yep. when maybe you ought to just sit there a little bit yeah, they, longer. Or they chase him, right? Or, or they decide they're going to loop him. You know, which does work sometimes. Don't get me wrong, right? But but a lot of times those birds just go, I mean, they go right, excuse me, right to where you were sitting. So I think that they've got a, well, I mean, they have to, right? They, they've got a really good sense of spatial acuity. I mean, if you're a turkey, you really have to. Mm-hmm. So they know where things are at on the landscape. They hear somebody calling, they know where you're at. Maybe they're just not sure about you yet. And they just want to go quiet and see what's going on. And we see it pretty regularly. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish, with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor, and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. Nosler is known for their bullets, and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate, and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. So a gobbler's up in a tree, and he hears some hens. Mm-hmm. Do you think he knows who that hen is? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and then we come in with a call, and all of a sudden we're some exotic from some new, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> the, the, listen to that." Like, so, so that's a that's a great question, and and I don't know that I've got a really good answer for you. Seriously, so I'll speculate. Um, I think that I don't think that turkeys understand voices the same way that you and I understand voices. Like, you know, like you, you pick up the phone and you hear your best friend on the other line and you know, it's them because of their voice. I don't know. And I can't prove that I'm right or wrong here. Okay? I don't think that they operate like that. And the reason I don't think they operate like that is I don't think we're good enough to replicate voice well enough that if they were able to distinguish voices, they would not be like, that is not a Turkey. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like all, and don't be wrong. I mean, all the call makers and everything is not a criticism, but if they were able to, I mean, you guys can tell whenever you're hearing a computer generated voice, like there's very little question. There's like eh, something just a little bit twitchy with that. You can, you can hear it in your ear. I think that if they had that resolution, we'd shoot a heck of a lot fewer turkeys every year. I do think that generally they, um, they're able to uh, understand tone, understand activity, and 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 the nuance of rate, of tempo, um, and I think that what happens is is that the uh, the noise that we make from calling mimics enough of those characteristics that it's it's what lures them in. That said. You know, there are, there's potentially folks out there that are working. I mean, we're not, right? Because it doesn't, and, it, and that's like, you know, things that manage turkeys, interesting side studies, things that really don't matter. It's way over, that's a really way over there for us, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's not that it's not interesting. It just it doesn't help us put more birds on the ground. Um, there are people that do do that kind of work. And maybe at some point we'll realize that there are voices, 
Um, they do. Now that said, I do think males have voices. Okay. I do think that males are able to distinguish characteristics of gobbling such that individual males have uh, I don't want to call it voices, maybe signatures. Individual males have specific signatures that you're able to know, okay, that's Bob because he gobbles, you know, like this, or that's Jeff because he gobbles like this. Um, but I don't think it's a, I don't think that it works like that for females and uh, for the male female interaction. Now that's entirely speculative guys. There's no mm. data out there whatsoever. That's just years of observation and, and how these birds move. Well, so. I'd like to add that Bobby can fool the Merlin, the Cornell Merlin bird ID app with a mouth call. Uh, only and, one of our, our team. And that nobody can. else on our hall well, can do it. <laughs> you know, I, I would tell you that that's a, that's a, a great thing. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know, but uh, you know, it's, um, it's probably a lot of people can. Well, but. yeah, but it's it's tough, right? Because you know, I mean, a part of hunting turkeys is the assumption that the noise we're making is unique enough to them that they want to investigate it. So, That's what about really what it is? What have you learned? You uh, drum and fascinate. Just, mm -hmm. We always want to we always ask the scientists right. that we talk to what do you know about what can you tell us about drama? not much no i mean like not there's not much known like i mean i can tell you what i think but we we don't really study it and, and there's a reason we don't study it is because it doesn't put more turkey babies on the ground right and and i don't mean for the listeners and everybody out there i don't mean to say like oh brett doesn't care yeah. we may no. get to that someday yeah you know? it's just it's just in the pantheon of things that we can fix drumming's not one of them we really mess with yeah you know um here's what i think um I think that it's an ultra low frequency that allows the birds to somehow communicate um, territoriality and space use and, and who's there and that um, it probably carries a lot farther than we realize because it's so low. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's potentially a way for males to advertise for females in a, in a, you know, we, we generally think that like um, uh, gobbling is the way that they, they, you know, mm -hmm. advertise their presence and territoriality. I mean, they don't really have like fixed territories, but you know, stature, but I also think drumming probably plays a role in that. Um, but again, it's just, I mean, I'm not a auditory call, you know, auditory type of person like that studies that stuff. People are, but it just, it just doesn't fall underneath our like day to day stuff. It's cool. Yeah. You know? Um, and, but you know, I think it's probably more about presence and stature. And, and so, and you're, you're probably could ask 10 people and get 10 different answers, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying I'm right or wrong here. I think it's probably more about present stature and making yourself known to be avail like available in the area type of thing. Like, you know, like, Hey ladies, I'm here, but also that low and that low frequency kind of also says, Hey dudes, I'm here type <laughs> of thing. Right. Um, but, but that's just what I think. Yeah. It's a cool, sound. it's a cool sound. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard, you know, as I've gotten more and older in turkey science, I spend less time turkey hunting. Um, and, and that's partially because my daughter's kind of coming of age right now where she's starting to get into going outside and that kind of stuff. So I spend a lot of time with her doing that. Um, and I used to move a lot faster. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so cool of a sound to get out there and hear. And the students hear it all the time, and they hear it outside of the reproductive season, which is cool. Cause they'll be out in the woods and they'll be like, Oh, oh okay. And just, just like randomly here at like two o'clock on a Tuesday, you know? So, um, I don't know what, I don't know what it means. That's what I think it means. You yeah. Know? That's no, I appreciate you. And, and you know, and you'd probably, I, and honestly, you'd probably get 10 different answers from 10 different people. Um, because it's just not something that, that like these little nuanced behaviors is not something we spend a ton of time on. And it's not because they're not interesting. It's just, you know, does it help with babies on the ground? Now, maybe 20 years from now, Somebody will figure out, oh, yeah, I mean, if you can get the ones that stay in this frequency range, then that absolutely puts babies on the ground. We'll be like, oh, we missed it all. So. Seems like the more a turkey gobbles, he's opening himself up to a coat. Do you have any data that shows that, that something like that would Gobbling is risky. It, it, is, it really is, right? Because it advertises your presence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number one predator on landscapes is humans, all right? And we, we just – and I don't know if you guys went to the the – uh, research updates yesterday. I think Mike talked about the male survival paper we did um, with all the stuff across the United States with all the males we had. Um, so about 83% of males will survive in the absence of hunting. 
So we lose about 17%. And, and that split up predominantly um, uh, predations, like 13 or 14% of that 17%. And then the other 3% is like getting hit by a car or, you know, disease or falling out of a tree or whatever it else, else it happens. Mm-hmm. All things are kill turkeys. Um, so this small percentage get predated. And then, you know, when you're in places that hunt, you know, it's another 30% or 35%, right? So, so you're talking about this 14%, let's call it 14 or 15% that get predated. Um, what predates them is interesting. Um, we can definitely do a study, and, and Patrick Whiteman is the name. Um, he's at the University of Georgia. He's postdoc. And actually, he's a research scientist there. He got promoted. Um, you should talk to him because he actually looked at how coyotes and hunters and turkeys changed spatial risk use on the landscape with some of our data. Um, goblin is loud. It's an advertisement. It tells birds that you're there. It tells predators that you're there but you know when you look at you and you see the pictures right you see the pictures of coyotes standing in the background like eight eight jakes chasing them off or four gobblers all bowed off running you know running them off and everything and um i think that there's obviously predation risk to adult males um we don't really lose a ton of adult males during the reproductive season we just don't like from our telemetry data. I mean, you get a few here and there, but you just don't find them dead that often. Usually whenever we start to have mortalities is later in the summer and the fall, based on most of the data I've seen, whenever they're in small male flocks after reproductive activity and they're just wandering around aimlessly on the landscape and something comes across them. Um, You know, pretty much only, and, and I say this, you know, only really three things eat turkeys on the landscape when you get right down to it. You know, it's coyotes. It's uh, bobcats and it's owls. Like those are those are the only three things that really predate turkeys. Um, we, there's a there's a whole uh, like bunch of folks talking about like nest predation and like armadillos and raccoons and, and now I mean there's only really three things that eat turkeys. Um, so most of that mortality is categorized by that that fifteen percent is being eaten by you know bobcat, which is probably number one by a long shot. Um, coyote is probably number two, and then and owls is probably also number two. They're probably kind of close together. You could easily go in there and, you know, change how these birds operate. But what's interesting is they don't gobble every day. And they'll mm-hmm. gobble at the same time every day. And sometimes they won't gobble for two or three days, you know, in the same area. And they move all the time. So it's pretty tough for, like, a coyote to – hone in on them gobbling and then happen to sneak them, I guess. Um, Bobcats less so. I mean, a a bobcat will get after, you know, the birds take a wrong left on a road or something like that, some path and the bobcat will, they'll get after them pretty quick. So, um, yeah, we all have a bobcat story of sitting there and and one sneaking on you, scare you to death. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, we all got a coyote story, you know, Mm -hmm. them come, you know, you're calling, they come running right in on you. Right. I mean, that does happen. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, uh, predation when it occurs, I don't think it's just cause they're gobbling. I think it's just all, it's like a conglomerate of activities and you get a bunch of birds traveling together and, and that kind of stuff. I'm surprised um, it doesn't happen more though. It, it, that, that number really <laughs> surprised well, you, mm-hmm. you, Dudley, is that number, doesn't it surprise you? Well, I mean, I've, I haven't seen it myself like. I mean, I've, I've seen a bobcat in the distance that I thought I've called up. I, I tell you what I have seen is, you know, domestic dogs running around, mm-hmm. and they will go right to a gobble. You know, you're sitting there in the morning, and you're hearing your turkey gobbling, and you see some domestic dogs yeah. coming across, or, or maybe some coyotes, and and then the turkey stops gobbling. And yeah. I just assume that that's, that's what it is. Yeah, some of it is like that. Absolutely. You know, because, I mean— why be stupid? But if they actually right. catch them, maybe, a, you know, that's probably a, yeah. a different story. But, yeah, but the mortality rate for males, and this is a really important thing for males don't die. Like, they just don't. I mean, they're, they're in big groups. They hang out together all day. They got a lot of eyes. They can fend off. And, and So just, a, a takeaway from that would be if you've got a hunting club and you've got some birds and you don't shoot all of them, They'll be there next year. Yes, 100%. Yeah, we were talking about yeah. that with Mike recently. Yeah, 85% of the time, they're going to yeah. be there. They're going to be there, yeah. I mean, if you got, you know, if you got 10 birds, eight and a half of them, you know, are going to be there next year because they just don't, they don't die unless they get shot, okay? I mean, and if they get shot, that that 
eight and a half goes to, you know, 45, 55. You know, five, four or five of them are going to be left because you're taking them out. Um, and that that's what's called an additive harvest rate. Okay. I mean, that's that's how many we take out. You know, males generally, Jake's especially live, right? Because, I mean, if Jake mortality was really, really high, we wouldn't have any two-year-olds, right? Jake's live because they live in big groups and they chase stuff off. And one of the things that's interesting is, and I don't really know how to segue into this, but I will, but people don't recognize that turkeys, they fight back. They, they think that they're butterballs <laughs> and they're not. And, and I get into, I get into huge arguments with folks about nest loss and people don't realize that turkeys are mean and mama turkeys are really mean. And, and you know, we, because in the, the issue with nest loss, because I mean, we lose 80% of our nests every year, right? Of that 80%, 80% of it is because of a bobcat or a coyote. That's what's causing those hens to abandon. They're either getting eaten, maybe owls in there too, but they're either getting eaten or they're getting flushed off the nest. That's it. That's what's causing it is those two or three species. And then people say, well, raccoons are a nest predator. And, and raccoons are, no, they're not. I have never seen a raccoon run across the field and drag down a turkey hen, ever. Armadillos are not nest predators. You know, um, possums are not nest predators. I'm getting there. Hang on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, possums are not nest predators. They're scavengers. When the hen is gone because of some other event, those critters come in and eat the eggs. Not They did not drive the hen off. The, um, there's a, a kid, a uh, postdoc by the name of Wesley Boone at North Carolina State University who just published his great paper of a hen whooping up on a raccoon on her nest site, defending her nest. You know, we, we got a picture of a Gould out of Arizona, some work done with Nathan, with uh, Nathan Fife with Arizona Game and Fish that has a fox with its head underneath a nesting hen on the nest trying to get the eggs, ignoring the freaking hen sitting on top of it. And she hatched out the nest successfully. She had bears, bears, Closer than you and I are right now from her and her nest. Didn't bother her at all. The, the, the issue that we've gotten into is we've ascribed anything that's seen as a nest, as a nest predator, and it's, it's a problem in how we... It's a, it's a huge problem for the field of turkey biology because we ascribe conservation actions and management based on what we know and we've unfortunately, and I'm and I'm at fault for this, okay? Because mm -hmm. most of the papers, actually, the few papers that are out there with cameras on actual turkey nests were mine, and I called them nest predators. So this is my fault, and I'm trying to clean this mess up. There's things that try to eat the hen, coyotes, bobcats, owls, that cause nest abandonment. Everything else is a scavenger. Everything. They they come in and eat the eggs after the hen is gone, and we know this. Because we've just finished this, Mike and I finished this big paper up looking at, at some nest predation stuff. And because we go collect eggs after these, because we know with the GPS data, the hens leave, right? Because we go collect the eggs for genetic work. Two days after the hen's gone, we can go collect eggs. If it was something that was there to eat the eggs, the eggs would have been gone. They were after the hen. Hmm. So what's happened is the stuff shows up when the hen's gone and the eggs start to stink or something like that. And then we're categorizing that as nest predation when actually it's just scavenging stuff on the landscape. And they may have not, how do I say this? Uh, the hen has been sitting on the mm -hmm. nest, but once she leaves, um, they're not, being sat on anymore it's not so it's not depredation hatch. yeah it's not it's the so nest is gone they're, the they're nest is eating gone. an inert egg yes at the, that the, point when the hen is gone that's no longer a nest that's a pile of eggs on the landscape it's not a turkey nest and it's just being scavenged and and if you think about it wouldn't it be easier for us from a conservation perspective thinking about because we all want more turkeys right growing mm -hmm. more babies if we could say coyotes and bobcats don't like this kind of vegetative community, which we can say. We know from GPS data on coyotes and bobcats. Let's create that. And let's get let's create that because turkeys will nest in anything. And then if the turkeys start nesting where the coyote and bobcats don't go, are they more successful? And the answer is yes. We think they are. 
I was part of Aaron Ulrey's master's work. Yeah. So you, earlier you were talking about, I'm going to get beat up for this. Yeah. Well, what you just talked about is mm-hmm. 10 times going to beat you up. Well, I'll yeah. I'll just but, point that out. No, absolutely. And, and what you'll get is you get the guy that says, you know, the, the person, I don't want to pick on any particular guy out there, says, oh, well, you know, raccoons get into my uh, chicken coop at the house and just tear the crap out. Yeah, they're domestics. Domestics don't have any sort of fight mechanism in them at all, right? It's all flight. I've got pictures of turkeys bowed up on um, indigo snakes in South Texas. We know they fight off raccoons. We know. I mean, think about how big a possum is. I mean, you walk outside your door. If there's a possum there, it like gets scared and waddles off, right? I mean, right. a turkey's going to beat the crap out of a possum. Mm-hmm. Okay, an armadillo. Nobody's ever shown me an armadillo pushing a turkey off of a nest. They're, they're scavengers, right? The one that's going to get me beat up is feral pigs, okay? Because that's that's the that's the the current you know criminal of the turkey reproductive thing. Oh no no, feral pigs are no, they're not. They're not. Feral pigs generally don't even exist in the areas where turkeys operate, where they where they lay nests. And feral pigs, you know, I think there's only one photograph in the history of turkey biology of a feral pig at an actual wild turkey nest, maybe two, ever. And feral pigs, I mean, there's one personal communication from like uh, 04, someone saw a feral pig eat a turkey. Um, I think there's like a picture of it uh, that made the social media rounds, right? But it seems but, like pigs are typically in the bottoms and drainages and things. And, they are. and hens Turkeys are normally nest nesting in the yeah. upland. But, right. but you ask anybody who's uh, in the southeast, turkey hunter, they like, oh man, feral pigs are just eating all the nests. Mm. Right? But, but would you would you agree that if a feral pig ran across a nest, it would scavenge it? Absolutely, hundred percent. But that's not predation. That's not what caused the nest to be lost. They are there after the hen is gone, because feral pigs don't see female wild turkeys nesting wild turkeys as a food source. And if you look at all of the food studies that have been done in, on feral hogs, feral pigs. They don't suddenly, like, it's not 40% turkey remains in their guts. That's not a thing. Yeah. It's, it's you know, lots of worms, lots of tubers. and you know, So there's acorns. a lot of anecdotal comments. Yeah, we, we call this, that scientific, non-scientific wild-ass guesses. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure, I'm 100% certain that at some point a feral pig studied, you know, stumbled across some hen on a nest and flushed it off and ate the eggs. I'm 100% certain. But... And let me be really direct on this. If feral pigs were a problem, there wouldn't be a turkey in Texas anywhere. That's a good point. I, I, <laughs> look, I'd like to also make sure we – I think this is important to make. Sure. If, if you're a guy out there hunting this mm-hmm. spring and you run across a nest, we don't, you don't need to put a camera on it and watch all this <laughs> stuff. I mean, no. would you please talk to that? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, yes, it's great to find a turkey nest on your property, Right. It's awesome. I love finding them. We do it professionally. Um, Basically, if you you come across a turkey nest, based on what we know about us, the scientists, flushing birds in the old days to count eggs and stuff, there's about a one-third chance that that bird's never going to come back, especially for Easterns. Easterns are super twitchy. Rios don't really care, okay? Um, But Easterns are like, they're gone, right? Um, So if you come across a nest, just back out. Get away as quick as you can. Don't sit there and look at it. Don't take photographs of it. I know it's cool, guys and girls. <laughs> I know it's cool, okay? But you want that. You want to be as away from there as fast as you can because you want that hen to come back and stay on that nest. Okay? Don't put a camera on it. We've actually done studies. Justin Dreibelbus, he's the head of the Texas Wildlife Association now. He's one of my former graduate students. He, one of his research projects was to go out and put cameras out on the landscape, on turkey nests, on dummy nests, just putting a camera on the nest increases the rate of nest loss about 2% a day. So if the hen comes back, you've penalized that nest about 2% for every day that that camera's out there because other things, corvids, you know, or, uh, crows, ravens, they cue in on that kind of stuff. Raccoons, I swear they will follow the scent trails in. That doesn't mean they're going to get it and the hen's not going to defend it. But you get too much disturbance, she's just going to be like, I'm out, right? Yeah. And 2% mm-hmm. so, a day is huge a day. over the nesting. Yes, over a 20-day period, that's you know almost 60%. Yeah. So, so you don't want to – anything that disturbs a nest is bad. Now, now uh, hunters, okay, 
we occasionally hunters will flush a hen during hunting season, right? Because you get, you know, birds in her nesting. That's fine. Just move on. Don't do a, a 10 meter by 10 meter grid search to take a picture of the nest. Most of the time, based on the GPS data we've got from, from female uh, nesting hens and hunters, hunters don't come across nests very often. You know, they get close to them, but they don't even know the hen's there. They just kind of pass by them. And the hen just stays hunkered down. Um, you know, because every nest that we can get successful is more turkeys, right? And then talking earlier about how hard it is to grow turkeys, you know, yeah, it's cool, but you know, we don't, we, I mean, we've even stopped putting cameras on nests. You know, we've got some experimental work with some, some Rios we're doing that we're going to put some cameras on some nests this year, but it, but it's, it's purely experimental, right? Like intentionally mm -hmm. they were brought in for experimental purposes. So we're going to manipulate them. Um, but we don't, I mean, we don't even in the old days before GPS guys, like we would go in about, um, like, uh, Day 10 of incubation, 12 of incubation, because most, most nests fail by about day 10, just like a 50 or 60% of nests, 70% by day 10 of incubation, they fail. If we can get you to like 21 days, your nest is usually successful. So like we try to get you over the hump, right? Like that's what we're, we, we can get the bird to 21 days of incubation. That means she's probably not going to get found in the last week. Awesome. First 10 days, they just fall off the landscape. Um, we've actually done, um, you know, some of this, uh, um, experimental work trying to, you know, figure out when the best time to go check these nests are and everything like that. In the old days, we just walk in on them about day 12, count eggs and that kind of stuff and put our cameras on them and just get out, get out of the way. Now she's over there. There's a stack of dots on a computer screen. We don't even mess with them. We don't, we don't even get within hundred yards of them if we don't have to, because, Less disturbance is obviously better. We don't want anything following our scent trail in. We don't want, you know, we don't even, we don't even go to nest sites until they hatch these days. Yeah. I mean, it could skew the results. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and it used to, and technology has allowed us to kind of get around that. So. Dudley, I wish we could get him to talk. <laughs> if, we could, if we could loosen him up here and get him to talk. <laughs> well, what do you guys want to talk about? I mean, I got time, so. <laughs> wow. it, just, it just keeps getting better, you know. Um, oh, I got all kinds of stories. I mean, you know, we had that we had that bird today that the guys caught. Uh, actually, the guys and girls caught, you know, Rachel and everybody, and a uh, eight-inch beard, no spurs. I don't even know. Yeah, pretty amazing. You know, so. What are we not asking, Doug? I Well, there was we had hit on the – we had hit on the hen thing earlier with, um, and I, I wanted to go over this mm -hmm. one more time. Typically, does a hen just go out into an area and 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 make a nest and pick? I mean, do they? So we go through all this work trying to have the best nesting habitat, early successional. Mm -hmm. You know, all those cool words we're using now and and habitat manipulations. Um, is she just going to blind or? Do we just hope that she's going to make a nest in this awesome cover we've created? Or is she going to actively seek out the safest area of early successional cover? No, that's a good question. So um, it all comes down to usable space, okay? Um, so taking a little bit of a backup, um, early turkey science, uh, think, think window of 1990s, early 2000s. The thought was that these females would go out and they would uh, prospect the word we use now. They didn't call it prospecting back then. We'll look around and identify where they were going to put their nests. And then they'd come back, get bred, and they'd go back to that spot. Okay. Well, the problem was we were doing it with radio telemetry, right? So huge error bars around the. I mean, we had no idea where these birds were at, to be brutally honest. GPS comes along. We find out that what's happening is, is these birds are not going to any place they've ever been before. Okay. So they're going to new places outside of their ranges that they currently have. And that's where they're putting their nests. Now to your question on space, they are absolutely using the areas that we manage for. Um, about, so in, in a fire maintained, just as an example, in a, in a open pine savanna fire maintained community of, you know, that you would find moderately in the Southeastern United States, okay? you know, with your mixed pine hardwoods and those type of things, um, your two-year-old roughs, so areas that are two years post-burn, 
I want to say like about 60% of the females nest in those. Where in those is, is irrelevant, mm-hmm. right? It's because theoretically, you know, because they're fire maintained and everything like that, they're, they're moderately homogeneous. I mean, there's a lot of local scale heterogeneity, but at the larger scale, they're moderately homogeneous on the landscape, okay? Um, about 20-ish percent nest in the one-year roughs, so one-year post-fire. So you burned it last spring, they're going to nest in it this year, okay? And then the rest of them are just kind of scattered out all over the random place. So so the space, the usable space we're created of, of early successional vegetative communities is, is absolutely being used by the birds, but it's not pinpointable, right? It's not, you know, you can create 50 acres over here and they may not use it, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's landscape scale, not local scale. Um, what's important about it is, is that these birds that are selecting these, these two-year roughs, these two-years post-fire areas, those are optimized really for brooding as well because you can still have bare ground, Mm-hmm. So the, the poults can still move around because they can't like crawl over all the thick grass and everything like that. Um, and um, they uh, lots of insects, lots of early successional forbs. And usually they're, um, when we're fortunate, they're butted up in areas that have got good thermal cover because there's been some really neat work showing how uh, females with poults are selecting um, vegetative communities that are multiple degrees lower in temperature to help the poults thermoregulate. And that seems to actually have some positive benefits on long-term survival. So, so it's not, um, it's, it's not like at the specificity we want, Dudley, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. but that's absolutely being used in, in, in the more usable space. Um, and it doesn't have to be just fire maintained. I mean, that's just one example, but it could be mechanically maintained, you know, any sort of brush, you know, brush management, that kind of stuff. That's, that's good. Um, we, you know, in our in areas that are more industrial pine, and which is a lot of in the southeast, mm, right? A lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, yopon, sweet gum, you know, that stuff acts as as barriers to movement. So you'll often see these birds nesting on um, roadside corridors because that's the only place sunlight gets through the trees to the ground and creates any vegetative communities. So fairly close to roads, we've seen some of that in some of our analyses in these areas. Um, that's suboptimal. Even though it's the same vegetative community, it's long and linear, and things that are long and linear are, are predation corridors. Sure, right? yeah. So, so you know, and we've got oh man, I got some maps I can show you guys of um, how birds operate in industri- in some of these industrial pine forests. They will walk around blocks, uh, you know, quarter section, a section blocks because they can't physically go in them. So you see a lot of, of squares. When yes, you're, when uh, you're on the GPS points. Dots are all on the yes, perimeter of the squares. Absolutely, and on, on roads in certain areas because there's just not good good ways for them to walk through it because turkeys want to see, right? And that's the other good thing about this usable space thing is, you know, whenever you have these one- and two-year roughs, you know, everything's been burned. So they're – I mean, it, it's, it's heterogeneous, but it's kind of homogeneous, you know, across a broader scale – Everything's been burned, so you've got pockets of stuff that's high, but they can see through it. And birds, I mean, turkeys have really good vision. You know, contrary to some of the things you see on social media, they can see pretty well. Mm -hmm. So they want to be able to see and and have those communities around them. So, yeah, the creation of the vegetative communities, the early successional stuff is super important. I think it's more important in the southeast, uh, a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I think it's more important in the southeast than the Midwest and the the Plains regions. Uh, uh, Time out. What are you seeing on social media that says turkeys don't have good vision? Oh, I see stuff pop up occasionally all the times so that's blurry at distance and that kind of jazz. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, no. I just delete them. I don't follow them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think mean, I remember that one. Oh yeah, I just, I just ignore it. Well, so. I, 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 thankfully, I, I missed that I one. I don't so. do a whole ton of social media. Uh, admittedly, you know, I mean, and what I do put up is basically me being proud of my students because, fr- because frankly, Mike is the funnel for almost all of our work. Like his Turkey Tuesday thing, which I'm not going to take any credit for, even though I told him to call it Turkey Tuesday. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But his Turkey Tuesday thing has been just gangbusters for getting science out, right? And he's doing such a good job of it. And when he talks about stuff, it's, it's, it's ours. I mean, like 99% of the stuff he puts out is something that he and I are doing together. There doesn't need to be repetition from me. Yeah, he uh, is you know, doing, he he's is doing, doing he's doing such a good job with that kind of stuff. So, so yeah. I, I want to go back. You mentioned that, that that oftentimes this hen is going to a, an area she's never been before. Yes, so it, if she's successful, 
And will, the, will she go back yes. the next year to that same area? Yes. Caveat. Not always. Okay. So totally random. I, I, we've had the birds and this is the, this is the uniqueness of birds. Okay. We've had birds that'll be successful one year and literally go back to almost the same bush the next year. Like, I mean, within a couple of feet or the other side, we've also had birds that'll be successful one year and they'll be four Some... miles the other direction the next year. Generally, they have a spatial fidelity um, as they get older to reproductive areas. And, and we think, and I've got a graduate student working on this right now, we think that that's driven by the fact that turkeys, you know, they're, they're a lecking species, no different than, they're, they're galliform, right? So they're no different than like your prairie grouse, but they, they operate in what um, uh, Watson Stokes called like an exploded lek, like a much bigger area, okay? Um, Chad, one of my, he was a master's student, now doing a PhD with me, he estimates that the size of that lek is about seven kilometers in a circle. Okay. Lek meaning? Meaning area where they're going to make babies. Okay. Okay. Um, where they, they go to breed. And it's about seven kilometers. And in, in that seven kilometer kind of circle, they don't interact with anybody outside of it. Like the chance of them interacting with a bird that's nine kilometers away is zero. Um, but interacting with a bird that's within that circle is like 80%. Okay. Um, so when we think about how these birds are structured on the landscape, they may be going back to that particular area because of where they're breeding at, just where the males happen to be available to them. And, and we don't know the answer to that because sometimes they don't go back to that area. And you think if you're successful in a place once, you should go back there again, right? I mean, that's generally how it works. I mean, that's literally how humans work. I think we call it dating, correct? <laughs> but if, if you, if it doesn't always happen though, because sometimes they'll be successful in a spot and they'll move 400 meters and be unsuccessful. Sometimes we'll have multiple females nesting within 75 to 80 yards. I got a spot right now. Birds that are like at the same time nesting 75, 80 yards away from each other. And other times I won't have birds from the same flocks that we catch within a half a mile of each other. Hmm. So it's, there's a lot of behavioral idiosyncrasies that we run into that we don't really know what makes a bird choose to go left or right. But what we do know is when they go left or right, what they're looking for broadly, those early secessional, often in our system, fire maintained, mechanically maintained systems that have the ability for them to see, but also, you know, this, this complex vegetative community on the ground that they can forage on and stay hidden in. So. Excellent. Dela, he, I think we're going to have him on again yeah. multiple times. Yeah. I, I can sense this. Yeah. I like talking about turkey. Yeah. We've been nerding out for close to two hours. Yeah. And we got a lot of good good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, this is, I'll say this. It's always nice to be able to just talk about turkeys in a layperson perspective to people who don't care about the – the mathematical code for the dynamic Brownian bridge movement model that we use to estimate range sizes on a daily basis mm -hmm. and talk about the, the basic biology and, and what we get from all that fancy stuff. Right. And it's not just me. I mean, there's, it's not just Mike. I mean, Mike and I do not go to the field like hardly at all. We have staff that do almost all of that kind of stuff. Our grad students and our technicians that are out grinding right now. So it's actually all of them. We just kind of, you know, kind of manage the chaos as best mm -hmm. we can. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I'll come back anytime you guys want to. Well, we're thankful for what you're doing. And it, it uh, gosh, it's just, it's really exciting. We've got this thing, Gamekeeper Grants. We need to make sure that you, you are, we will help Mike with some stuff. Give, give it to the young scientists that are out there. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> well, you just need to make us aware of where there might be a need. Nick, ba Nick Backner at Tennessee Tech. So we, we'll make a note yeah. of that. And, I'll, uh, I'll take it, yeah. Nick and Pat, Patrick Whiteman at the University of Georgia um, would both be be excellent recipients, brand new PhDs. So, yeah, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I mean, I'm old. I'm so old. I mean, this is, I mean, this is like my 20-somethingth year. I mean, we're, we're 11 years into data collection at one study site in Louisiana. It's the, it's the longest continuous data set on wild turkeys ever. 
in history, I mean, ever. There's just one place in Louisiana that we're working. We got a hot 104 birds as of today tagged out there. So yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm old man. I don't want to be a telemetry job until I'm 80. <laughs> I need to figure out a way to retire. Well, we're, <laughs> we're excited that the, you know, the family tree of, of turkey biology, turkey biologists is expanding. It is. And, yes. Uh, there's, there's, it's not just three folks scattered across the United States. You know, there's 20 or 30 people out there really digging deep. Um, and, you know, all these students and techs that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that we have a lot of them that are also hunters. Oh, yeah, most of them um, are. And it stays that way. Um, but, yeah, we're glad you guys are around. And uh, I'm glad we finally got you sat yeah. down and, and learned something. I, I, burned, I burned a couple hours of you guys' day, but <laughs> hopefully you'll be able to get something useful out of it. Absolutely. So. Well, Dr. Brett Collier of LSU, yeah, we've enjoyed it. And listening to you, it's, been, it's, it's really fascinating. And I know we'll have you on again. I look forward to it. So whatever we can do to help, please let us know. Uh, Dudley and I have got to go to a – we've got actually got to go to the Sheffield booth in a little while. Oh, cool. And, and uh, meet and greet some people. And we, I'm sure you'll be around. So, But I can think of other things I want to talk to you about when it comes to the turkeys, and we'll, we'll devote another podcast to that. But thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do for the wild turkey. It, uh, I don't know that we can say that strongly enough no, I, I, I appreciate it and i appreciate you guys letting me ramble a little bit and you know hopefully you'll be able to cut that down some so <laughs> yeah you said a lot of words I, i'm gonna have to go back and look up some of this stuff <laughs> I, was just, I was just making it up don't worry about it <laughs> well that said why don't you say goodbye dudley goodbye dudley thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the gamekeeper podcast and be sure to tune in again Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.